patterns have been fueled by growth in certain agricultural sectors, such as meatpacking, uh, as well as poultry processing, as well as enclave industries such as construction, textiles, manufacturing, steelwork, and carpet weaving. Now, I'm sure some of you are probably thinking to yourself right about now, what on earth does a presentation on immigration in the US have to do with my work and myself and what I do here in Canada? Why is this relevant? How is this relevant to me and to my practice? Well, the obvious connection is that immigration engenders teaching and working with students and families who are linguistically and culturally different. However, as educators and practitioners, I also want you to be thinking about a different and perhaps a more deeper connection to my research as I um, talk about it. And that's at the level of policy and how policies impact our work as professional educators. Um, as teachers, as administrators, as staff members, as researchers who do work in schools, we must abide by particular policies, accountability policies, curriculum policies, language policies, reform policies, etc. In effect, policies regulate our lives as um, educators. We're not only the objects of policy, but we're also the subjects of policy. We implement policies at the school level or at the street level, but we also interpret policies as we bring them bring that policy to life within our classrooms, within our schools, within our districts. But what happens when we're asked to implement policies that may be harmful to children? Or what about when, we, when we're asked to do something that we might not be comfortable in doing? Like asking the child whether their parents are in the country legally. Or what about the ethics of policies? especially policies that may be harming children, like particular accountability policies that focus more on test, good, test scores and canned curricula than in developing critical thinkers. We are, in many ways, in an era where the types of policies that, we, that are being enacted are not made by nor for educators but by legislators, by policymakers, who are holding themselves accountable to a different community than to the community teachers and administrators hold themselves accountable to. So it's important that we take time to understand what's going on in all areas of policy so that we can better understand phenomena and search for new ways to situate ourselves as critical actors as well as responsible educators. So let me get started on my presentation. Um, again, the new Latino diaspora was a term that was coined by Stanton Wortham and his colleagues in 2002. And um, according to the uh, Pew Hispanic Center, um, it, it really was trying to identify a demographic shift that happened right uh, at, at the same time when small towns in um, the United States, particularly in the Midwest and the Deep South, were facing tough economic challenges during the late 1970s and early 1980s. Many of the small town uh, communities and cities in these areas couldn't attract employers and, and, or industries. They had little infrastructure to support any type of industry um, and they had no viable workforce to speak of. In other words, rural and small towns were economically bleeding during this time. Younger locals had moved out en masse to the larger cities in, in search of uh, work, and older generations who were left be behind no longer had the ability, nor the stamina, nor the skills to be productive members of the workforce. So due to the rapid population decline in these areas, local government leaders quickly realized that they had to do something to attract new industries in order to increase the employment opportunities and to sustain local economies. So what they did was to provide a host of incentives 
Uh, these came in the form of property tax relief, industrial revenue bonds, tax shelters, etc., to lure businesses into specific sites. Uh, and they also offered other types of incentives that would uh, prevent uh, industries that were already there from leaving. They believed that these incentives collectively would create jobs that would translate into higher buying power and increase the local revenue. Taking advantage of that, um, of these incentives were a host of integrated global food industries. These were large scale agribusinesses that are really are associated with production, processing and distribution of agricultural products such as chicken processing, pork manufacturing, and cattle butchering. In like fashion, established industries in these areas, such as textile mills, carpet mills, and steel mills, also saw an opportunity to push for a newer, i.e. non-unionized workforce in order to maximize growth and increase their revenues. So what happened within a very short period of time was a drastic uh, transformation of small town rural America in many parts of the US. Places that once had very little opportunities and job prospects now boasted of having some of the largest employers in agricultural and food manufacturing. Unfortunately, the vast majority of the new jobs were slightly above minimum wage for work that was less than appealing and often very dangerous. Moreover, the harsh working conditions created a tremendous demand for new labor, forcing employers to import uh, immigrant workers to meet their production demands. Many of these companies actively recruited uh, newcomer immigrants from Mexican towns. They actually went into Mexico to recruit. Uh, or they went to the uh, US-Mexico border region to recruit or they provided some incentives to their local employees to say if you bring your family member or, your, or uh, a friend into the company, we will give you a bonus. So as a result of these targeted recruitment efforts, US states that historically had no minorities now saw a significant rise in the number of non-white individuals. These, these, uh, these individuals were comprised mainly of Latino uh, immigrants, but sometimes Asian immigrants, immigrants from the Caribbean, and African immigrants as well. So in a nutshell, or in effect, the large-scale agribusinesses radically transformed traditional migration patterns in unprecedented ways within the United States. And I'm gonna show you a series of slides just to kind of, uh, to, to give you a, a visual of how that happened. Here it is, the population in 1980, and here's the population of folks who identified as Hispanic or Latino. And look at the concentration of where these folks were, pretty much in the southwestern part of the United States. That's pretty much where um, uh, immigration has, has uh, occurred. I want you to focus pretty much on the, on the sections that are not shaded in the, in, the, in the middle portion, the white portion. There it is in 1980, there it is in 1990, there it is in 2000, there it is in 2006. And some of these places are, are not, are above, in the, in, they're in the 25 to 100 uh, percent area of growth. So we saw, the, in other words, these were folks where uh, pretty much the town went from zero to having about 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 residents, all who were Latino. Um, this growth provided particular challenges for schools and hospitals, law enforcement agencies, and other social service providers as they struggle to rapidly adapt to meet the needs of these newcomers. But what's more important for me is that the context of reception in these new diasporic communities was neither overwhelmingly positive nor overpoweringly negative. In other words, despite the fact that there was clear evidence that the newcomer populations were constructed as a problem, i.e. that they, they, they were viewed as an American, as being different, as stealing jobs, 
as needing to learn English, etc., etc., the perception was simultaneously softened by a counter discourse that recognized newcomers as hardworking, as reliable, as religious, and as willing to do jobs no other American was willing to do. In effect, there seemed to be a love-hate relationship with the immigrant in these revitalizing communities. Locals loved their work ethic and their reliability, but they weren't particularly fond of their language, their culture, their background. Now, I'm not suggesting that the newcomer immigrants were free of hardships, and I'm not suggesting that they were free of discrimination. No, I'm not saying that at all. Rather, I'm saying that they were tolerated insofar as their contributions to the local economy was made evident. In effect, despite being seen as problems and as having particular linguistic and cultural deficits, there was a particular, there was a different receptivity towards the immigrant newcomer. A receptivity, a receptivity that really stands in marked contrast to the vitriolic and venomous anti-immigrant rhetoric that we see in the political discourse of today within the United States. If, in the words of Sofia Vienas, Latino newcomers to the US during the late 70s and early 80s were primarily seen as workers and not human beings, then surely Latino immigrants in 2012 were seen as neither workers nor human beings. So what happened between 1970s and 2012? Why did the mood towards the Latino immigrant population go from one of inconvenience to one of intolerance? I argue that at least three significant uh, variables fundamentally altered the immigration discussion and discourse within the United States. The first was a change in federal immigration legislation. Uh, it went from the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986, what was called IRCA. And IRCA really focused more on employers and employer sanctions. In other words, if an employer knowingly brought an undocumented person to, uh, to work and hired them, then they were slapped on the hand. And that changed in uh, 1996 there was a new law that was uh, passed by the federal government called the Illegal Immigration Reform and Responsibility Act in 1996, ERIRA. And that focused on the individual migrant, particularly visa overstayers, the undocumented, and those who were deemed criminal aliens. So in other words, the scope of immigration legislation shifted from the employer to the individual immigrant and his or her individual transgressions. A related issue is that immigration policy formation and legislation also shifted away from the federal government to the state level within that same period. Oftentimes under the pretext that the federal government was ineffective in curbing immigration matters. Here in Canada, that would be the equivalent of a provincial legislative body drafting immigration laws that really are under the aegis of, federal, of the federal parliament. In other words, the scale of immigration enforcement was drastically narrowed. And that really troubled long-standing issues of federalism or what is a federal responsibility and what is a state responsibility. So that's the first point, there was that change. The second point that altered the immigration discussion was the 2001 terrorist attacks of the World Trade Center. That uh, event in itself ignited a tremendous backlash against cultural and religious others, particularly those of the Muslim faith, and set off a national discourse of, on securing the borders from quote unquote foreign invaders. In effect, the 9-11 attack reinforced the beliefs that the borders were broken and that more resources needed to be poured into immigration 
and border enforcement. The third variable that impacted the immigration discourse was the recent subprime mortgage industry collapse, which set off um, an economic chain reaction that's rife with financial instability, institutional collapse, and an overall decline in stock market values. This resulted in a recession of global proportions, high unemployment rates, and an overall loss of jobs and incomes. With a depressed economy, immigrant communities were vilified and turned into, into proverbial scapegoats. In other words, the worse the economy got, the greater the anti-immigrant sentiment became. And I believe it's critical that we need to focus on that latter point. Because I believe the current wave of anti-immigrant and, nativ and nativist sentiment in the United States is directly tied to broader economic concerns. For example, if we simply look at one economic indicator, such as unemployment, we're able to trace how spikes in unemployment rates are associated with waves of anti-immigrant propaganda and legislation. For example, look at the chart here. This, is, this traces the US unemployment rate between 1940 and 2011. I want you to focus on those two arrows. The first one being 1975, and the second one being right around 1980, early 80s, between 80 and 82. In 1975, the US unemployment rate had spiked from 5.6% to 8.5% of the total civilian labor force. In fact, the average unemployment rate for the 10 years prior to 1975 was 4.6% uh, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. This upward trend in unemployment had reached a threshold by 1975, and the US witnessed unemployment rates not seen since 1941. It's important to note that while the number of immigrants to the United States had also grown, during the 10 year period between 1965 and 1975, the actual rate of the growth was lower than the actual rate, uh, than the actual rate of immigration between 1940 and 1965, and certainly much lower than the rate of immigration at the turn of the 20th century. In other words, the US was not experiencing a sudden flood of immigrants by any means. Yet, by May of 1975, the Texas State Legislature chose to amend the Texas Education Code to provide that only US citizens and lawfully admitted non-citizens would be permitted to attend public schools in that state free of charge. While school districts were still allowed to enroll undocumented students, they did so at their own discretion. The reasoning behind this amendment was simple because public education in the United States is a state level responsibility, the state of Texas aimed to deny undocumented students from attending public schools and thus shift the burden of funding away from the state. In response, many districts implemented a tuition fee for undocumented students. In other words, although undocumented students were not banned or barred from attending public schools in Texas, they did have to pay a fee in order for them to attend. One district in particular, the Tyler Independent School District in Texas, was eventually taken uh, to court by 16 Mexican students and their parents, who argued that the fee unfairly targeted undocumented children. The case would eventually become the landmark US Supreme Court case known as Plyler versus Doe, which was decided, by the way, in 1982 in favor of um, students and their parents. But it's important to note that the Plyler case, that in the Plyler case, the undocumented immigrant was cast as a burden to the state. And, uh, and that was the primary driver of the policy that, that was implemented by the state of Texas. This policy emerged precisely at the time when unemployment rates were at an all-time high within the state of Texas, as well as the rest of the union. And following a huge stock market crash, when, when the Dow Jones lost 45% of its value in the wake of the 1973 oil crisis. In other words, the state of Texas didn't implement these changes in a vacuum. It's not like they woke up one day and said, hey, let's 
kind of go after the uh, immigrants, the undocumented kids. They were instigated by broader economic, social, and political unrest within the state as well as the rest, as well as the rest of the nation. Unfortunately, the undocumented student became the scapegoat for Texas's economic woes. This pattern of immigrant scapegoating was reinforced in the popular press, which continued to feed images of a country being overrun by the undocumented. For example, in 1977, the US News and World Report ran the following cover stories in April and July of that year. This is a border crisis. Illegal aliens out of control, question mark. Time bomb. These images not only depict an invasion of undocumented immigrants, but the, suggest that the country is in crisis because of this unchecked mass migration. The image of the uh, immigrant as burden, particularly the, Im the immigrant from Mexico and Latin America, was reified in the broader national discourse. What's most interesting about these particular images, perhaps, is that they were circulated at a time when unemployment rate in the US was hovering at 7.1% of the civilian labor force, and inflation rates had risen, to, had risen to unprecedented levels, despite the fact that immigration had been shrinking. In essence, the bigger crisis was not the undocumented immigrant, nor the, nor the Mexican, but the economic crisis facing the country at that time. The critical work of UC Irvine anthropologist Leo Chavez suggests that the proliferation of these images had a particular cor uh, peculiar correlation with, uh, with the economy, specifically the US unemployment rate. As the unemployment rate took a downturn, uh, took a downturn following the 1974 recession, there was a sudden increase in the proliferation of magazines covering the topic of, of immigration. Immigration uh, coverage in the media was particularly active and acute during the early 1980s. Remember the second little arrow that I showed you? Uh, when US unemployment rates had once again risen above the 7% of the US civilian labor force. For example, in the period between 1982 and 1983, US unemployment rates skyrocketed to 9.6%. And once again, popular images were widely proliferated expressing concern about the undocumented immigrant. These new images, however, were qualitatively different than those of five years earlier, in that they didn't show law enforcement officials policing the border, but showcased images of individuals crossing the Rio Grande River into the US. It's important to note that these images were widely disseminated despite the fact that the overall number of immigrants to the US had been on a steady decline since 1980. Now let's think about that. Why, is it, why would immigration be on a decline? Because there's no jobs. <laughs> I mean, you see what I'm saying? And yet, you're seeing this type of proliferation happening. Many legal scholars suggest that this anti-immigrant picture emerged as a reaction to the growing frustration with the economy coupled with a reemergence of racially tinged nativism that blamed these newcomers for the broader problems of unemployment and related problems that are associated with a depressed economy, such as crime, drug use, and other social ills. Despite the fact that research points to the fact that immigrants have practically no negative effect on the labor market, there's still a widespread belief that immigrants take jobs away from locals or native-born citizens. I want to repeat that. Despite the fact that research, that, that research suggests that immigrants have practically no negative effect on the labor market. Why? Because immigrants are competing with other immigrants for jobs. They're not competing against doctors. They're not competing against uh, other types of workers. They're competing within a very segmented labor market. So yes, they do have an impact on it. And yes, immigrants do, do keep wages down. But they're compete, they're, since they're competing with other immigrants, that wage compression is only happening, their only competition is with other immigrants. So they're hurting other immigrants, not the uh, citizens within um, the, the, or US citizens or in that particular context. So naturally, this perception is enhanced during times of economic recession and high unemployment. 
There's an equally popular belief that undocumented immigrants compress the wages of local workers, despite the fact that this belief is, not all, is, is also not widely uh, supported by data. In fact, the research finds that since the vast majority of immigrant workers are concentrated in particular sectors of the economy, immigrant workers do have some effect on wages, but these wages are for jobs that would otherwise be filled by other immigrant workers. In effect, despite widespread evidence to the contrary, there is still a powerful perception that immigrants hurt the economy. These perceptions are largely driven by lay beliefs and attitudes that are informed by a complex mix of racial, xenophobic, and nativist ideologies. In other words, it is the perception of the immigrant that is powerful. And I believe that it's the perception that is what often fuels social and educational policy. If we continue to examine the unemployment rate, we can continue to see how spikes in unemployment have precipitated a wave of legislation aiming to curb this perceived immigration problem. There we have three states, Alabama, Arizona, and California. Let's take the last one first, California. Look at that big bump right in the middle. If we continue to, uh, if we look at California, we can see that in the early 1990s, there was a sizable jump in the unemployment rate in that state. Not surprisingly, by 1994, the California voter initiative known as Proposition 187 was passed by 59% of California voters. The Save Our State initiative, as it was called, targeted undocumented immigrants and aimed to curtail social services, including education and health care, uh, to, to this particular population. The voter initiative was significant not only because of its racially tinged uh, underpinnings and specific targeting of the undocumented as unworthy recipients of, pub of public goods and services, but because it marked the first time that this type of restrictionist immigration policy was left to popular vote. Although the law was immediately appealed, calling into question the constitutionality of the law, it opened the door for similar types of ballot initiatives across the country. So Arizona, being Arizona, followed suit, passing a host of ballot initiatives also between 2000 and 2004. By 2008, you look at Arizona's spike way in the end, 2008, but you see with 2000, 2004, there are spikes that are going there, but in 2008, the Arizona legislature repackaged a number of these existing Arizona laws and ballot initiatives into a single bill known as SB 1070, which was approved that same year. The bill made it a misdemeanor crime to be undocumented in the state of California and allowed Arizona police to detain anyone reasonably suspicious of being undocumented in the state. Reasonably suspicious if you just looked undocumented. I don't know how an undocumented person looks, but it's clearly in Arizona they must have thought that there was a certain look for the undocumented. But it's, I mean, that, that's, that's the kind of craziness that's, that's happening in, in the U.S. And it's problematic for a host of reasons. For it made it all but mandatory to carry your identification papers at all times. Nevertheless, while portions of SB 1070 um, have since been blocked by a federal judge, including the provisions that officers check the citizenship status of individuals, they did cause considerable co controversy and protests across the country. Now, despite the fact that both the California and Arizona decisions have been challenged in the courts, and major portions of the law, those laws have already been struck down by, a court of, uh, by uh, federal courts of law, national opinion polls continue to show that large segments of U.S. voters actually approve of the Arizona law and of the California law, and would consider similar laws in their own state. Because of these approval ratings, many states have begun the process of doing copycat legislation uh, and voter initiatives similar to SB 1070 and Proposition 187. These ideas have taken off. And they've taken off, especially within the past five years. And immigration has become a central political topic in the national discourse. Just to highlight very quickly how the topic of immigration is preoccupying the minds of state legislators and voters, one simply needs to look at the laws and resolutions that were presented to governors for signatures since the economic recession hit in 2007. The numbers are dumbfounding. Um, in since 2007, there have been over 7,300 bills and resolutions 
related to immigration that were presented to governors in all 50 states for signatures. 7,300. In, two, in, uh, in uh, 2011 alone, just last year, there were 269 immigration-related bills and, re and resolutions presented to respective governors between just the months of January and June alone. The vast majority of these bills were related to either limiting benefits uh, and services to the undocumented or to increasing immigration enforcement. Only a handful of bills like Connecticut's H uh, 6390 or Maryland or in California were these bills sympathetic to uh, immigrant groups. Clearly the vast majority of states are frustrated with the status quo on immigration and there's, uh, there's a radical momentum to do something about it at the state level. Interestingly, and here's the zinger, states that enacted Arizona-like legislation, Alabama, Indiana, Georgia, Utah, South Carolina, and Oklahoma, were states that had experienced similar immigration patterns, similar economic hardships, and had similar conservative voting bases as Arizona's. In other words, these were the states of the new Latino diaspora that attracted newcomer Latinos in the early 1980s because they were drowning, and now that the country was experiencing economic recessions, we're trying to figure out how to get them out. It's the irony of this all. It's important to note that the legislation passed in these states was also quite similar to Arizona's SB 1070 in at least four ways. They enable law enforcement officials to check a person's immigration status during the lawful stop. So if you got pulled over, you can, uh, you can get, your, uh, get asked to show your papers. They mandated businesses to participate in the federal government's e-verify system. They prohibited individuals who were not lawfully present in the state from receiving local benefits or public benefits. And they were all drafted, all of them, with the assistance of one man, Chris Kobach a former law professor and current Secretary of State of Kansas who was of counsel to the extreme right wing, right -wing organization um, called FAIR, the Federal uh, Federation for American Immigration Reform. And other bills were similar to Arizona's because they were all drafted by the same person. This is a person who News, Newsweek labeled America's deporter in chief. Alabama's HB 56, if you all have heard of what's going on in Alabama, is unique in that it uh, took immigration legislation further than any state had ever done, targeting all aspects of an undocumented person's life, employment, education, housing, utilities, health care, law enforcement, operating a vehicle, with the hope of making life so unbearable that individuals will self-deport. It even made it a crime to provide assistance to undocumented individuals in the form of housing, shelter, or refuge. So in other words, if you helped an undocumented person by offering him or her a place to sleep, perhaps a ride to the store, perhaps a bit of food, just to be a human, you were, you were in violation of that particular law. With respect to education, HB 56 specified that, that school officials must determine the citizenship status of every child enrolled in schools. In other words, they had to ask kids whether they were citizens or not. Several parties, including the Obama administration, had filed a motion immediately once the law was passed for a temporary injunction before HB 56 was to take effect. They argued in part that several portions of the Alabama law were either unconstitutional or were under the domain of U.S. law, back to the federalism situation that we were talking about earlier. The federal judge uh, who reviewed these motions enjoined them in part, particularly the sections for penalties relating to harboring or transporting an undocumented person, but denied the motion for injunction in other parts, particularly the section which makes it a crime to be unlawfully present, as well as the, the section related to education. In other words, the first, the first um, portion that uh, checking uh, that teachers had to check for the status of the of the children's state 
but that was appealed, that decision was appealed um, to the 11th Circuit Court and the appeals court granted a motion for temporary injunction. Um, so it's still waiting to be decided on. So um, the moral of California, of Arizona, of Alabama, is that legislators and voters will go to any means to create a chilling climate for undocumented immigrants, especially when immigrants are seen as hurting their economic interests. By cutting off public benefits, social, service, uh, social services, access to housing, health care, education, and other privileges, the voting polity and the legislative polity is sending a clear message that they're frustrated with the pace, frustrated with the pace of immigration reform. The anti-immigrant policies that have emerged in recent years are, are draconian in nature. They target all immigrants, turning them into scapegoats for political gain. They aim to appease both the nativist claims of an immigrant invasion, as well as the less extreme but equally powerful claims that immigrants take jobs away and resources away from local citizens while ignoring or downplaying the actual research in the area, um, as well as kind of the broader economic picture that we've talked about. In the United States, Texas opened the, opened the door for this new approach toward immigration legislation with the Plyler case. Um, they, that case uh, positioned immigrants as hurting the economy. California took it to the next level, making immigration policy by referendum or ballot measure. Arizona took it one step further by deputizing local officials. And then um, and Alabama took Arizona's notion of attrition through enforcement to a new level by limiting all aspects of an immigrant's social life. Um, it appears that we're now entering a new phase of, um, of anti-immigrant legislation in the United States. Um, and that's one that targets um, kids. Uh, under the guise that individual states are merely trying to protect public dollars, state lawmakers have increasingly pushed for extreme forms of anti-immigrant legislation that target the most vulnerable of this already vulnerable group. Their actions ignore the fact that according to research, the vast majority of children of immigrants are US citizens. And therefore, they have a right to these services under the law. There's a lot of rhetoric about anchor babies and trying to limit uh, the rights of um, uh, children of immigrants. So the rhetoric not only conflates um, children of immigrants with, the, with undocumented children, but they also exaggerate claims that educating the children of immigrants, whether they're legal or they're not legal, adversely affects the availability of public um, dollars. I believe that these claims are <coughs> grossly exaggerated. What really affects the availability of public resources are not the immigrants themselves, but the cost of enacting naive policies that demand symbolic accountability for a non-existent problem. These nativist tinge policies not only go after children, but they also aim to deny others the right to assist them in any way whatsoever. It just doesn't make sense to go after kids. The fact of the matter is that most of these policies just don't make sense. They're spiteful, they're grounded in racism and ignorance, and they do absolutely nothing to solve the immigration problem or the economic issues facing the nation. So why should educators in Canada care about what's happening in the US with respect to immigration? Because on the one hand, it is about immigration. But on the other hand, it's also about how policy decisions impact education and the daily work of teachers. We're in an era where educational decisions are aggressively being taken away from educators under the banner of accountability, whether it's accountability for education or accountability to the state uh, for public dollars. And so whether it's the US or Canada or the United Kingdom, educators have lost their individual and collective voice and haven't been able to speak against these types of draconian policies that are impacting children and families in negative ways. So how do we as educators find a voice? How do we insert ourselves into the policy discussion? We have a responsibility to the state, yes we do, but we also have a responsibility to children and families. And oftentimes we're asked to do things that put these two responsibilities at odds. So how do we engage the policy arena and speak truth to power? 
when doing so puts us at risk with the very institution that gives us our livelihood, i.e. our employers, while failing to do so may harm the constituents whom we're responsible for, the children and families. How do we negotiate that terrain? State workers such as teachers, law enforcement officials, and social service providers can't be subject to the political and ideological whims of voters or of legislators, nor they can they allow themselves to be co-opted and silenced merely because they occupy this precarious position in society as state agents. We need to unravel these types of policies and see these bills for what they really are. Anti-immigrant nativist band-aids for social, economic, and political hemorrhages. And only when we, as an educational community, embrace a radical politics of compassion, a radical politics of belonging, can we find a new voice and a new strategy for equity and engagement on the topic of immigration. Gracias.